<laughs> and despite the sun, here you are. This is wonderful. Welcome to a new term of Osher Lifelong Learning Institute in Central Vermont. We think we've got a good program and nothing better than Thomas and to kick us off today. Um, next week we have another interesting thing. I think it's Tony Kagan talk, talking about uh, the death and, dying, death and Dying Act in Vermont. So be sure to tune in for that. Um, let me this so I don't have to be stationary. Um, I've, I've known Tom and his wife Mary Epsilon for almost 50 years. In fact, it was um, over 40 years ago that they gave my then 16-year-old son his first programming job at their company Solutions, which they ran and oper they founded and operated right here in Montpelier. And Solutions, in case you didn't know, was a company that created some of the earliest software for the then brand new Apple PCs, which came, unlike today, with practically no applications on it. There was very little you could do. My son programmed his own games to play on his Apple PC. Anyway, um, Solutions uh, produced some of the first ETF, electronic trunk, EFT, Electronic Funds Transfer Software, which we all did for granted. Now, later on, Solutions was sold to Microsoft, and Tom worked for a time with that, with the parent company, introducing a lot of things that we take for granted today. He also had a spell <clears throat> with AT&T and was responsible for launching WorldNet, their first internet service provider, which popularized the flat um, rate for internet service that most of us enjoy today. Now, while his wife calls him her nerd, I think of Tom really as a renaissance man. He's a serial entre entrepreneur after solutions going on to found um, ITXHC, which was a a listed a company, one of the most successful and earliest voiceover internet companies. And more recently, he started a company here in Vermont called NG Advantage, which provides gas, liquid gas, liquefied gas to big commercial customers. He's done also his share of public service, serving as Vermont's transportation secretary in the 80s. He was stimulus desire during the, um, our big recession about 15 years ago, and he has consulted with several governors on technical issues. Add to all this, and you'll see why I call him a renaissance man, a novel and a short story, both available on Amazon. You can check it out. And his current blog, entitled Fractals of Change, in which he discusses many things. One wonders when he had time to do all the, with all that, how, how he had time to become also listed as an inventor on eight U.S. patents, and he also pilots planes. Okay, so if I made any attempt to give you more detail about the many things Tom has gone, we'd have no time for him to speak to us. So <laughs> he's been playing with AI systems since early on, and he closely follows this emerging technology, which is both intriguing and scary to me. So let's hear what he thinks about its enormous challenges and opportunities. I give you Tom Evelyn. Oh. Thank you very much, Edie. Uh, and to Edie, of course, is the Renaissance woman. Uh, I really am a nerd, and the reason my wife calls me that is it's much more useful than somebody who can't plumb and doesn't do a very good job at carpentry. Um, but I can get her computer and her phone working, and thank God that's necessary these days, so I, so I have a role. Um, this, this, thank you all for coming. This, this presentation is for mature audiences. We're all over 65, aren't we? <laughs> Good. Uh, AI seems to have come along just in time. It, it's like self-driving. Uh, you know, I'm getting to the age when I took the keys away from my parents and uh, 
I'm hoping that soon I'll have a car smart enough so maybe I won't be allowed to drive it myself, but at least I can go places. Uh, and artificial intelligence may supplement some of the memory that's slipping away. But let's talk about artificial intelligence. Um, it, like any new technology, it can be scary. Um, I don't, I don't want to break the suspense, but my hope is that it will be much more of a benefit um, than it is a drawback. It has good uses and has bad uses like any technology. There's no question about it. And people will use it well, and people will use it badly, and there's no question about that either. Uh, but if we understand it, um, then we can encourage the good uses and we can avoid, if not discourage, the bad uses. So let's just switch gears a little bit and go over to ChatGPT. Um, how many of you have, have used ChatGPT or used it with somebody else? Okay, great. Uh, for the rest of you, this will be your first introduction. ChatGPT was introduced on, in November 2022. You may remember it caused a great deal of stir. Uh, for a while, it was the most downloaded new application uh, on the internet. Uh, and ever since, there's been a lot of discussion about it. Uh, one of the reasons, or, or perhaps the reason, why ChatG artificial intelligence has been in development for a long, long time, uh, 50 years actually, uh, or some people say it's what Oz gave to the straw man, so maybe even longer than that. Uh, but when ChatGPT came out, artificial intelligence suddenly broke into the public consciousness. And part of the reason for that is how it appears to be able to engage in a conversation in a human language. Um, in fact, it can converse in quite a few languages, although it's best in English. Um, and in fact, it can actually converse. That is, you can talk to it, and it'll talk back to you. But I'm not going to demonstrate that today. I'm just going to show how it works when you're typing to it. Uh, along, uh, there was a famous computer scientist named Alan Turing who invented something called the Turing test. People had asked him, Dr. Turing, how will we know when there's machine intelligence? And he said, well, let's ask ChatGPT what the Turing test is. <laughs> Oops. Okay, let's see what it says. to be a little less wordy than ChatGPT. He said, if you're talking to somebody remotely and you can't tell whether that somebody you're talking to remotely is a computer or a person after some com conversation, then that's past the Turing test. We'll have artificial intelligence when there's something we can talk to uh, and we can't tell whether we're talking to a human or we're talking to a machine. Now, I could ask the same question of Google, which we've gotten used to, and I'll probably get an answer too. Okay, not a bad answer from Google either. So why all the excitement about ChatGPT? Uh, and by the way, I should point out the reason the Google answer is as good as it is this year is because Google's actually put artificial intelligence behind the search engine as well. Uh, so although it's not ChatGPT here, it's their own search engine called BARD that made the Google answer uh, better than it would have been a year ago. So but going back to ChatGPT, remember it's not just asking one question and getting an answer, it's being able to have a conversation. So now, I didn't say who was Alan Turing. I said, who was he? As, as if I were having a conversation with a human being, 
the, uh, chat GPT was able to figure out by he, I meant the only person that was referred to, just as a human would have figured out, in the sentence, in the um, exchange before, so I must be talking about Alan Turing, and it gave me the answer, understanding that it was Alan that I was asking about. If I go back to Google and I say, it's going to give me a search based just on who was he. We're not having a conversation. It's just answering each one of my inquiries. So you can see that, that chat GPT gets exciting um, because it's such, ooh, that's a long answer, uh, because it does so well uh, at engaging in conversation. Now we could go on on something, somebody would like to add, a question somebody would like to add to this conversation? Okay, for now, oh, yes. away from that AI thing, and then you get the sources, that, which is what I like. Of yes, you do. Things. And OK, uh, that's a very good point. Oops, I didn't spell sources right. But. We'll see if it figures it out. Uh, actually, you can do better than that. Sometimes it can be stubborn. <laughs> see if I can convince it to give us some sources. Yeah, now it's doing better. Just as um, Google has AI built in behind it, AI has Microsoft's browser Bing built in behind it. And so this time it used Bing. He was in the news back then. Yeah. Oh, Turing. Yes, very much. High school. Right, right. <laughs> okay, this time it gave us some sources oh. that we could use to check it. But I had to ask, but even that's sort of interesting in this conversation. So working with um, chat GPT is a little bit like working with a human being. You don't always get what you ask for exactly. Uh, and sometimes you have to drill down, and sometimes you just have to ask again. But asking again works pretty well because you don't have to repeat, you're in a conversation. It appears to, and I'll explain a little later why I'm only saying appears to, remember what you said before, uh, so you can have a conversation by just adding on to what you've been saying, rather than by having to say something entirely new. Uh, I, I'm stopping myself from digressing and talking about Alan Turing, because he's a fascinating person uh, in, in his own right. Okay, but let's go back here to our presentation. Okay, so where did, you know, um, artificial intelligence didn't come out of nowhere. So I said that for at least 20 years, there's been work going on that's led up to artificial intelligence. And, there's, and all things came together sort of at the end of 2022, um, so that a product like ChatGPT could be released. One of the predecessors that we're all familiar with is spelling and grammar checkers uh, and what goes on beyond that. Because in order to develop spell checkers, um, computer scientists had to develop something called fuzzy thinking. There, there's lots of ways you can misspell a word, and in order to recognize what you were trying to spell, 
It's not enough just to have a table of the common misspellings, but also the uncommon ones. And to uh, sort of figure out what something means, and, and of course it's not always right. Fuzzy think, you know, you tell a computer to add two and two and you're almost always gonna get four. But you have a computer looked at a misspelled word, maybe it'll get the right word, maybe it won't. That's a, a different kind of programming, and it's useful as long as it gets the right word most of the time. Then we went beyond spell checkers, though, to, can you see that? Oh, oh you don't see that on your screen, just a sec. Let me make sure that you can. Hmm. I'm going to have to play a little trick here somehow. Maybe I'm not going to be able to do that. Let's see. <laughs> it really does not want to let me do that. <laughs> this is very embarrassing. I would have asked ChatGPT how to do it, uh, and I might be able to get an answer. Now, uh, that one's not important enough for us to go off. Oh, so when I was showing Google, were you seeing the Google answers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were, okay. Well, we weren't in the, well, we weren't in the, I don't know where that was. And now you don't see ChatGPT either, right? No. Uh -uh. Now ChatGPT is there. Let's see if I can get to that other thing that I wanted to show you. Ah, that's what I wanted to show you. Okay, so notice I'm typing along in my word processor there, and there are three things going on. Uh, first of all, there's spell checking, which we're all used to. You see it's underlining that I spelled SA wrong, and if I right-clicked on it, it would give me options for making that right. Then there's the double blue underline under however. That's its grammar checking, which is somewhat more sophisticated it's trying to tell me that it would like me to put a comma after the however. And my English teacher in high school wouldn't agree with that, however. <laughs> however. <laughs> so I'm not going to do it, but that's what it's saying. And then, even more interesting in the progression towards AI, notice at the end the I-K-E-2 in lighter gray than the rest. I didn't type that. It thought it was thinking ahead that that's probably what I wanted to write. Uh, so it gave that. And so that was, <coughs> developing that kind of software wasn't easy. It meant going through millions and millions of documents and figuring out the patterns of the way people speak. Uh, and it turns out that a good prediction of what you're going to say next is what you said last, because our brains work that way. You know, all those annoying things that say, what's the last four digits of your social security number? And in your head, you have to go back to the beginning of your social security number. So the beginning leads to the end. And this kind of prediction says, given the words that were already used, what's the most likely or the most plausible next words? And takes a guess at it. If the guess is wrong, we don't say that's a lie or something. We just said it's the wrong guess, and we put in what's right. Well, that was developed a couple of years ago, and that's one of the important predecessors of artificial intelligence. Let me get rid of that now. Now we can get back to our presentation. Okay, so there were the spell and grammar checkers and the predictors. And now, remember that those who developed those programs were getting feedback from the program all the time, often without your permission, saying which times you liked the guess and which times you didn't. 
So they were getting more and more information on the way people speak and on the way that ideas and the way that language um, is developed and expressed and the way wor one word is likely to follow another. It's not only the programming techniques that were important to develop AI, but also the huge database of experience with how people actually use the spell checkers, the grammar checkers, and the type ahead capability, how often they agreed with the guests and when they disagreed with the guests. So that, that database, those databases were enormously important in, de in the development that was eventually AI. Another thing that was important going on at the same time was search. Those of you, almost all of us use Google or some other search engine. They don't actually search the web when we tell them to do something. What they do, um, they use a, a technology called web crawling. And all the time, they're crawling the web. They're going around looking at all the various websites. And they're cataloging all the words and all the phrases on those websites and making a huge database of which words appear on which pages of which websites. Um, and then I won't go into the technology, but they make something called a vector index that lets them very quickly find out which, find a data site based on your question. And what they do is take your question, the words in your question, code it up the same way as it coded up all the pages on the web when it was web crawling them almost up to the last minute, and then find the pages which are cl <coughs> most closely resemble your query. So if your query had cat and dog and rain in it, then it's going to try to find pages that have all of cat and dog and rain. Uh, and it's a little more sophisticated than that because it knows that rain and raining are sort of the same word and sort of the same context. Uh, so the, the technique of search was a way of going over a huge amount of catalog data and finding the data that's useful for answering a question. And what's called a vector search was a way to do that very, very quickly. That was being developed. The web crawling technology uh, that lets a computer go through almost all of the huge content of the web very quickly. Another technology that was part of developing AI. Uh, all of this was used for various marketing purposes. Tom, here's some water. Uh, oh, thanks. For predicting what products you'd buy depending on what products you'd bought before or looked at, um, for telling you which books you might like or, and recommending things on Netflix. So, all these technologies are going on and on. They went a little bit further with the assistants like Siri and Alexa, which pretty much seem to understand human speech uh, and certainly respond in something that sounds like human speech and have a little or a lot, actually, of the functionality um, that's in AI. So all of these things were building up uh, at the same time Something called machine learning was being used, um, not only to make self-driving cars, uh, but for technology. This is a SpaceX rocket landing on a barge. But what's particularly interesting about this SpaceX rocket and its landing on this barge is that both the barge and the rocket are drones. There is no human control over that. Right? And that almost had to be. Now, now think of what's going on. The barge is on the ocean. The ocean is moving. The rocket's coming down through the atmosphere. There's some degree of wind. Uh, so there's instability in both systems. And yet, the rocket manages to land on the barge and not tip over. What's actually going on beyond that is that there's lots of experience, not so much the, the, um, in order to predict, and not so much saying, well, if there's 10 knots of wind and if there's a wave coming, I have to do this or that, because you'd never be able to do it fast enough. It, what it's doing is doing the same thing that a human does when we catch a fly ball, um, is looking at the relative distances between things and very quickly doing 
almost trial and error, fire this rocket, fire that rocket, get stabilized, stabilized, stabilized. No, not at all predictable in advance, but if you have enough experience, enough machine experience doing it, and if you react quickly enough, and as computers get more and more powerful, um, then you can react more and more quickly. Uh, and in the end, you can get a car that can pretty, pretty safely drive itself, uh, or a rocket ship that can land on a barge. So all that experience and all those different kinds of programming uh, gave us the technology and the database of experience that was necessary to build a product like ChatGPT. On the hardware side, because there's an enormous amount of computation that goes into not only doing this, but then processing through all of that data to make up a sentence about who knows what until I answer the question requires an awful lot of programming. Uh, it requires an awful lot of computing resource, a powerful computing resource. Um, and this came about in a, a weird way. A company called NVIDIA, uh, which is now one of the most valuable companies in the world and nobody heard of a few years ago, developed special computer chips for one market only, the people who play video games. Uh, and what those chips had to be able to do is make images move very quickly. And because people buy video games based on how realistic they are, had to be able to manipulate very real images. So those special purpose computer chips are called GPUs, which means graphic uh, processing units, nothing more than that. Then, interestingly, um, Totally unrelated, there was the development of cryptocurrency, which I'm not going to talk about today. But cryptocurrency, for strange reasons, requires a huge amount of computing as well. So the people who were doing what's called crypto mining, building things like Bitcoin, used these GPUs, which NVIDIA had developed for graphics, in order to mint their Bitcoin. So there was another huge market for GPUs, and NVIDIA came out. Uh, with an even more powerful generation of GPUs. Now along comes artificial intelligence. We need these very powerful computers that can do a lots of things at the same time. Oh, turns out they exist because there they are in all of the bit mining operations. And so NVIDIA processors are behind almost, not all, but almost uh, all of the artificial intelligence because they developed this ability to do a lot of things at the same time quickly. It's, it's sort of serendipity um, that all of these things came together. And when that serendipity happened, it ended in a product in November of, of 2022, uh, which is ChatGPT. Chat GPT. Okay, so let's go back to where we've gone through all the predecessors. So how does it work? There. Now you understand it. <laughs> I, I asked ChatGPT to draw this picture. It's one of the things it can do is draw pictures. So, because I was too hard to explain, so I didn't want to do it. Uh, no. <laughs> so really, what goes on is there. There are a few layers involved in a product like ChatGPT. There's one layer that that's called machine learning. You're supposed to get that idea down from the bottom. Um, and what it really is is computers trolling through a huge amount of information, certainly everything that's available on the internet. If it weren't for the internet, all of that information wouldn't be available. And the computer is training itself in a way by practicing. For example, it would take a sentence and leave out a word, and then the program that's being trained will try to guess the word that was missing based on the words that are already there. At first, it'll almost always be wrong. The more it gets right, it, it, it gets like dog biscuits for being right. Uh, so it learns to store a whole bunch of numbers that make it make good predictions just based on taking stuff that's there, what's called masking some of it, and seeing what kind of job it can do at building the rest. Uh, Machine learning is also used in pattern recognition. Uh, we know that a lot of x-rays are actually read better by computers than by people. Not that two people's lungs are ever the same, but there's a particular pattern. Uh, if there's a cancer in a lung, 
that enough machine learning, enough processing, being told what was right and what was wrong, ends up um, giving you a way to recognize a pattern. Interesting thing about the machine learning is you don't have to understand why. You just have to understand what. You sometimes hear people say about artificial intelligence, but we don't know how it works. Well, in order to recognize a pattern, you don't have to know how the pattern's made. You just have to have enough practice in recognizing those patterns, right? I can recognize a plaid. I don't know how a pad is, plaid is woven, uh, but I know what a plaid is just because I've been told and because I've seen enough of them. And machine learning is really that just writ large, that learning to recognize patterns, not to understand them, not to understand why they are what they are, but to be able to identify correctly what a pattern means and then later what a pattern of pattern means. So we've been using machine learning for a while in image recognition and facial recognition, which is both good and bad, um, in science in various ways to understand, not to understand, but to identify phenomena that are going on. Then on top of that was built something, and I'm, I'm going to get to a page of acronyms in a minute, but something called large language models, or LLMs. That's machine learning on how language works. What we looked at as the spell checkers became grammar checkers, became predictors. So large language model is a computer program that can, uh, uh, in a sense, understand what was asked of it by the pattern of words um, and can put together a coherent answer in human language uh, by creating a, a pattern of words, often starting with the words that are in the question, just like a human being does. So in ChatGPT, there's a machine learning layer that provided it, in a sense, with its knowledge base, um, that it had crawled the web and crawled the web and been self-trained. Then there'd been another layer of human training saying that's a good answer, that's a bad answer. Training these um, large language models is, is actually quite human intensive right now. Um, you know, they were taught to give good answers. They were also taught, in some sense, some cases, like ChatGPT, to give politically correct answers. Uh, and to refuse to give certain answers uh, by the same, you know, they don't have a sense of values, uh, but they can, uh, they're, they're rewarded in their training, uh, and so they learn, and I'm putting that in quotes too, uh, to give the kind of answers that their developers want them to get. And then the final layer on ChatGPT, as we've seen, is just a browser. There's a browser program that asks you questions and because ChatGPT, as prodigious as it is, doesn't really remember you, the browser is faking it in order to allow a conversation to happen. So when I was asking questions before, um, every time I asked another question, the whole set of questions I'd asked before was fed back in so that it would have the context. If I turned my machine off or closed my browser or said this is a new conversation, it wouldn't remember the conversation we had at all. It wouldn't say, hey, Tom, we were talking about this. So the browser layer, the user interface layer, is what faked the ability to have a conversation by repeating back the context over and over again uh, to the program each time that it asked a question. Uh, we wouldn't be a good talk unless I cleared up some acronyms. Okay, you hear a lot of the AI, we all know now, it means artificial intelligence. ML, it's a machine language, the machine learning rather. So machine learning is that process of, of learning how to do pattern, or to recognize certain patterns uh, and to create certain patterns. LLM is a large language model. On top of machine learning is special learning about human languages. So something that has that and has it as is as extensively trained as ChatGPT is called an LLM or large language model. There are LMs, regular size lang uh, language models behind Siri, behind Siri, um, behind Alexa. They're not as large. They don't appear to be as knowledgeable and as erudite as ChatGPT. There's GPT itself. <laughs> which stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Again, a just a long-winded way of saying you put something in 
It generates an answer. It's able to generate that answer because it's pre-trained, as we talked about, and it's a transformer in technical terms because it transforms the question into an answer. Uh, in, uh, in AI gibberish, we don't really call it an answer. We call it a prediction. But it, it transforms the query um, into a prediction, which we think of as an answer. And then something that um, is, is becoming more and more common, but you haven't, probably haven't heard this ag acronym yet, is RAG, R-A-G, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Uh, that makes up for the fact that the large language model like ChatGPT, remember at first it said, hey, I don't know anything after April of 2023 because that's when my training ended. Well, if you wanted to answer a question about something it wasn't trained on, either because it wasn't in the training data or because it happened later, you give it the ability to search, like Google does, either on the web or in some specialized data that wasn't part of its training as part of getting its answer. So nothing fancy about it, but it's called retrieval augmented generation. Um, and it's being used more and more in order to make AI more useful. So what about hallucinations? Everybody heard about hallucinations in AI? Okay. Um, you know, and, and if you're not being polite, it lies sometimes. Okay, and it, when, when does it lie? Well, just like a person, you know, it has a tendency to make up an answer when it doesn't know one. And if it sounds authoritative enough, my wife accuses me of this all the time, if it sounds authoritative enough, then we figure it's telling the truth. Uh, and actually, from its point of view, it, it, it has no it, It's still an it. It doesn't have any concept of truth or false. What it does have a concept of is plausibility. Just when we, like when we were looking at that look ahead that was trying to guess the next word I typed. If it guessed wrong, we don't say, hey, it was lying. We just said, guess wrong. Uh, but it always gives the most plausible, the most likely answer. So where it doesn't have the, the correct answer uh, as its most plausible answer, it just makes up a plausible answer. Sometimes you say to it, uh, look, you know, that's suspicious. Give me the URL for that. And it'll come back and it'll give you a very plausible URL, you know, www something or other related to what you said dot com. And you can look it up and the URL doesn't exist. And you say, hey, that URL doesn't exist. Oh, I'm sorry for the confusion. Try this URL, which also doesn't exist. Uh, and, but the reason that happens is because it, want, it gives the most plausible answer. You can instruct it and it'll pay some attention to it, say when you're not sure. But if you don't instruct it that, uh, then it says you asked for an answer, so I'm going to give you an answer. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to just say I don't know. Sometimes it does. Um, you, but you can just, again, this is very much like dealing with an assistant or dealing with a person. If you're not sure about an answer, ask for a reference. If you get a reference, check it. Uh, or if two things don't make sense, call, um, do the same thing you would do with the person. Hey, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Why did you say this when you said that? Just when it said to me, well, I can't uh, give you any links because I'm not able to browse. And I said, well, you are able to browse. You use your browser capability. And it, and it did do it. Okay, But that's exactly the way you would deal with an assistant. And you can never quite trust what a human tells you. And you can't trust what a large language model tells you for an answer either. But it's not because it's trying to deceive you. It's just trying to make you happy and give you an answer. OK, what's all this mean for education? That's interesting. I think one of the things it means, and this is good for us who are getting older, is that memorization is even less important than it was before. When it was hard to do research, memorization was essential. Uh, it's become less and less a part of education for a good reason, that it's easy to get the information. You don't have to memorize it all. You, if you don't know a fact, you don't have to go to the library and look it up. You don't have to know how to use the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. As a matter of fact, nobody, 
younger than us even knows what the Reader's Guide to Periodical <laughs> Literature is. And they probably think a library card catalog is somewhere where the games are kept. But you, know, you don't need those things anymore. Uh, and you don't need memory much anymore, uh, at least not huge numbers of memorized fact, huge amounts of memorized fact, because you have easy access to it. And that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Another good thing about not using memory exclusively, uh, Eating mentioned that I used to fly a plane. And I used to work for Governor Dick Snelling as his transportation secretary. And he's a private pilot, too. And we, sometimes he'd fly somewhere in my plane. And whenever I was coming into Montpelier Airport or Bennington Airport or something, I'd have to look up what was the frequency that you talked to air traffic control in at that particular airport. Uh, and he would always make fun of me and say, I know the frequencies of every airport in Vermont. Why don't you know the frequency? Why do you have to look it up every time? That's very inefficient. And I said, it never happened, but I said, Dick, someday they're going to change one of those frequencies, and you're not going to know it. You're going to be on the wrong frequency, and I'm going to be on the right frequency, because I'm looking it up. Well, in a world where facts are changing very, very quickly, there's an advantage to not memorizing them, because what you memorize may be obsolete uh, by the time you get around to using it. So we have access not only to more information, but to up-to-date information more of the time. Um, so memorization is less and less an important part of education. Uh, and I, I, again, I don't think that's a bad thing. AI is a writing tool. Like it or not, AI is a writing tool. Like it or not, students are going to use AI to help write their papers. Is that so bad? Well, when I first took physics, the whole first week was about how do you use a slide rule. And I remember when calculators were invented, People were saying, maybe those shouldn't be allowed in the physics classroom because people won't learn to use slide rules anymore. Well, they were right that people didn't learn to use slide rules anymore. But you only needed a slide rule so you could get answers. Uh, and since you could get answers with the calculators, why did you have to waste time with a slide rule, which wasn't all that precise anyway? Um, we don't think it's cheating to use a speller checker, or I don't think we do, to use a speller checker or a grammar checker when you're writing a paper. Um, why is it cheating to have something like ChatGPT uh, look at what you did and critique what you did? Uh, I don't think it is. I think what does have, so um, students are going to have this tool. What's important is that they learn to use the tool. So learning to use AI is going to be one of the most important skills that are taught in school. And what's it mean to learn to use AI? It doesn't mean to learn to be a programmer. As a matter of fact, AI programs extremely well. And for the first time in history, I don't think we're going to need as many programmers as we have. Um, but it does mean you need the ability to ask the right question. And even more important, critical thinking needs to be taught. Because you need to evaluate the answer you got. You need to know how to evaluate the answer you got. You know how, need to know how to ask for verification. You need to know how to look for self-contradiction. Uh, you, you need to, to, to be able to play with the logic of an answer um, and try other ways to find out whether the answer you got is right. Those are critical thinking skills. They should have been taught all along. I don't think they're taught well enough. If, if people knew them better, then they wouldn't be as worried about false information. Uh, but right now, it becomes an even more essential part of teaching because you can't use this tool called AI. You can't, certainly can't use it safely, but you also can't use it effectively uh, unless you learn critical thinking. So teaching that is essential. Uh, AI may be a great leveler. You know, we have a generation of kids in progress who haven't gotten a very good education through K to 12. Um, and colleges may not even be necessary. But many of them have not gotten a good education from K to 12. But part of what they haven't learned is stuff that they don't need to know anyway, because they can always look it up if they can learn how to use AI. So I have a hope that if we can teach those who, who didn't get as much out of the early years of education as they should have, to use this new tool, in a sense, they'll leapfrog. You don't know they won't know how to use the slide rules, but nobody needs the slide rule anymore anyhow. 
and they don't know how to use a dictionary, and that's okay. Um, and they may need some. Uh, they may need to learn to use AI in order to write a critical piece of something. You know, why do we learn how to write in order to communicate? If we can use AI to communicate better, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. So their communication skills will be enhanced if they learn how to use AI. So I'm hoping that in education, AI will be a leveler. What's it mean for jobs? Well, for one thing, flexibility is greatly enhanced. If you do a job and the technology keeps changing because you have access to most up-to-date information about technology, um, it's, and incidentally, it's not only AI. You know, the only reason I can fix anything besides a computer at home is because I can watch a YouTube on, on how to do it. But um, if I can find the YouTubes, if I can find the instructions, if I can find the latest instructions on how to do what I need to do, then my fl I don't have to go back to school necessarily as my job or my profession changes. I just have to keep learning how to use the tools that tell me how to do things. I think, and this is the first time this has happened in my lifetime, that uh, more white collar, uh, us overeducated people, uh, at least th those of us who aren't retired, are more danger um, than people who have what I call hands-on skills. And this is a trend, this isn't only by AI. You know, we saw during the pandemic, um, we said, well, all the non-essential people stay home. Uh, but then there were the essential people, and we realized how much we needed them. And they were the hands-on people. They were the nurses and the carpenters uh, and the plumbers and, and the surgeons. Um, and it sort of happened both with AI and with the end of the pandemic that, that the world has sort of said, well, you non-essential people might as well just stay home anyway. Uh, now, it's not that people are non-essential, and it's not that there aren't going to be all kinds of new jobs, but I think we're going to see a rebalancing in the workforce because blue and pink collar effectiveness can be increased with access to AI, as long as they know how to use it, no matter how much or how little formal education they had, more than white collar expertise is enhanced. And the AI tends to replace white collar jobs but it doesn't replace hands-on jobs. Uh, programming, as I've done it all my life, and I've been lucky to do because it's a skill that's in great demand. AI is really good at writing programs. Programming language is very easy languages to predict. Um, I, things I would have programmed a couple years ago, and I programmed for fun and to teach my grand, I was teaching my grandchildren to program up to two years ago. Now I'm teaching them to use AI to write programs. Uh, because that's a skill that's needed. And I'm finding that the skill I had as a programming manager is, for the first time, maybe more valuable than the skill I had as a program, because a programmer, because the instructions that I give AI are very much like the instructions that would, you would give to a human. And the checking that I have to do, did I get the program I wanted, does it work? That's the kind of thing uh, that a manager does. And when, again, when you deal with AI, it's like a manager dealing with an employee. But that's a skill. That's a skill that requires communication. It's a skill that requires checking that you got what you wanted to get um, and going back over and over again until you really got what you wanted. Um, there are going to be lots of new job categories. For example, um, AI deployment and training. Uh, there, there's lots and lots of training of AI to do specialized things, um, whether that's carpentry or diagnosing heart disease. Uh, it takes people to train uh, AI. Yeah, you can use AI to help train itself, but it also takes people. As I talked about, project management becomes more and more important because all of a sudden we have all these new workers. They just happen to be robots. Uh, AI-enhanced medical research. Um, that. Research has always been limited by how much a researcher can keep in her or his head at a time. Uh, and machine learning can keep more in its head at the same time. So you can find out things, you can correlate things if, if, if you can look at more than fits in a human brain at a single time. That doesn't take humans out of research. Or out of research. I think it puts more humans in research because they'll be more productive by using these tools. And the same thing for engineering. I think we'll be do, able to do better engineering
because we have better tools, there'll be more jobs for engineers because each engineer is able to produce that much more. There's a new concept in AI. And, you know, when he asked me what I was going to talk about, I said I didn't want to give too much of an outline because things were bound to change by the time that I talked. And <laughs> sure enough, that's true. The, the new concept is called AI agents. And what are AI agents? They're nothing but um, a, an access to a LLM, a large language model, we remember, uh, where the LLM is given a particular role. You're an engineer, you're a programmer, you're a designer, um, you draw pictures like this picture here. Um, and it may be given special tools, um, the ability to use certain programming languages, access to certain information that help it with its specialty. What's interesting about agents is you can put multiple of them on the task, just like we'd put multiple people on a task. And that the agents then can communicate with each other. One can check the other one's work, for example. Um, so that you get a more reliable end product, do away with hallucination, perhaps one make sure that you get the style that you asked for, that things are redone that have to be redone. Um, and, so, and the interesting thing is that humans, that agents can interact with humans. So you can have a team, as I've tried to show in this picture, of humans and AI agents working together. And I think that in many ways, that's going to be the future of work. Uh, and let me show you an example of that, assuming that I can get it to go back to my screen the way I want it to. Good. Okay. Okay. I told AI, I, I told a program that Microsoft wrote called Auto Builder that helps build agents that I wanted to make a team that had, uh, I wanted four debaters, two on each side, an affirmative and a rebuttalist on each side. I wanted a debate moderator and a debate judge. Each one of those is an agent. Sometimes agents are called assistants, just to be confusing. But I wanted each one of them. Um, and then I wanted to be able to, as a human, give them a debate topic and have them debate it. And then I wanted the judge to be able to debate the topic. So let's say we have to, in a debate, you always start out with a proposition of some sort, a statement. Okay, so we'll say Apple is better than Microsoft. Ah, now what happened here is the debate moderator agent gave them the proposition, told them to debate it. The affirmative constructive, de we're not going to go through all the arguments, but the affirmative constructive debater gave its answer. The negative constructive debater gave its answer. The affirmative rebuttal debater rebutted the affirmative speaker, uh, negative speaker and uh, negative rebuttal debater rebutted the affirmative speakers, the constructive speakers, and then the debate judge gave them each a score and gave a justification for the score and the debate was over. So what I showed you then, that's not a canned debate. It actually was all generated after I put that in. And that's an example of agents working together to do something. Now, this is just a toy. Um, but one interesting thing we could do with it is a human could be any one of those, but not all of the debaters. So if you were staying at home and being a debater, you could practice by taking one of the roles and seeing how you did in context against the other. If we were trying to see which was the best LLM, all of those were using ChatGPT4, uh, but some of them could have used BARD, um, that's Google's uh, LLM, some of them could have used Llama, uh, which comes from Meta, Facebook's home company. And we could have seen which one of them is better at winning the debate. Uh, or another possible use, you know, this, this literally took a day to do. No more than that. 
Um, and I had to do very, very little programming, almost none. Just tell it what kind of team I wanted and what I wanted the team to be able to do, and it generated this team. If I were going to write a paper on Apple versus Microsoft, I think I'd kick off a debate first just to make sure I had the arguments on both sides and that I knew what was the likely rebuttal. Knowing something about how large language models work, which you're not going to get is a lot of originality out of this, because it was trained on what's already on the web, which isn't always high quality. Uh, it's still up to us humans to put some originality in. But if you need a summary of the thinking that's gone before, which let's be honest, that's most of what we start with when we're doing research is find out what's been thought before. Uh, this is an excellent way to get it very, very quickly. Anybody else have a topic they'd like to see debated? What's that? Yes? Um, I think what we're going to find is it's too politically correct to get into that. But, uh, so I have to turn that into a proposition. So I'll say Trump should be put in jail. It's not a personal judgment. I'm just... I, I think it's going to waffle because its training was not to get itself in trouble. But let's see. It, one of the frustrating things about this demonstration is I can never quite tell how long it's going to take. It's not because of the topic. Um, <laughs> it's trying to waffle its way out of this one. Um, let, let's see if we get any more answer at all. It's already got itself confused, by the way, because it started with the wrong debater. I think I thought it was negative, so it would start with the negative. But, uh, the, you gave it a tough one, but that's a good one to illustrate that there's a lot that it can't do. And I'm, you know, people are in favor of putting guardrails on so it doesn't do politically incorrect things. I'm not. Uh, I don't think we need to limit our thinking. And I think if we do, we're just going to get back whatever we put in. You know, and it's not going to help us to really explore things. Um, to leave out the answers that we don't think are politically correct. I think we have to be, trust ourselves to be good enough at critical thinking. Uh, while this debate's going on, because I'm not quite sure how long it's going to take, but we'll come back to it. Uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to show you. Um, a, a GPT, remember we said GPT means generative pre-trained transformer. You can write something called your own GPT which is sort of like a special version of GPT that has some special instructions. So I wrote one called Factor Fiction. Come on. Oh, come on. Okay. Where did the four come in? Where did the four? The, the four here? I'm sorry. Oh, it's GPT version 4. Okay. okay. The chat GPT was first released as version 3.5. We don't quite know what happened to the other versions. And then 4 came out in March of this year. Good question. Okay. So this fact checker, this is a GPT I wrote to check facts. It can either check a simple fact. And it's supposed to always give references. Let's see if it does. Say, Tom Eslin lives in California. So it's doing some research. It's not what we asked. No, you didn't ask live. Oh, yeah. But it gets down to it. There's no direct information. Instead, references suggest his primary uh, residence in Stowe, which is true. And then notice that it gave links uh, to places where it got that information. In fact, it looks like it got it from the bio um, in, in my own blog. <laughs> but, uh, but that's a reasonably good reference for that. Uh, but fact or fiction can be used for other things. If I have a document, and let's find a uh, 
that's a document that I wrote um, to be a blog post. And suppose I want to check to see how accurate is this document. What it's going to do, hopefully, is look up the key assertions in the document and then try to find some source for them outside the document. This, to me, is an example of the positive way that AI can be used uh, to reference check things, to see if they're correct. In my case, often I write a blog, and I know I read something somewhere, but I can't remember where. So I give it to the fact checker, and I, it often finds the reference for me, uh, which is helpful, because I like to put the link in. Yes? So would a, uh, a high school teacher or professor use that to check a student's paper? I, I think it would be a good idea. and. I, um, I think if I if I were a high school professor or teacher, I would like the I would then ask if I found that the references were wrong, for example, ask the writer why didn't you use uh, GPT to check your references? No. You know, you yeah. you don't have an excuse for getting it wrong. Yeah. So so he gave me lots of references for things that it felt were um, assertions that in my paper. Uh, that were worth checking. Um, again, this took less than a, no programming went into writing this. I had to give some instructions to a GPT of what I wanted it to do, um, and that's all that had to be done. In fact, but Tom, what about if there's another Tom Epstein? Yeah. Uh, it it would have said it was ambiguous. Fortunately for me, there aren't, because uh, the name apparently got mixed up coming through customs. <laughs> so when I wrote this fact or fiction, all I did was write these instructions that you're seeing here to GPT to tell it what to do. And that's all the instructions. And, I, and from those could create that personalized GPT. So again, huge potential, I think, for using AI um, both to check on itself and for using AI to enhance the things that we do all the time. Let's see how our debate turned out. Ah, ah it did do it. Okay, legal accountability, upholding the rule of law, precedent for future precedents, public trust. Uh, okay, so this is it. Fair enough, because I didn't say should Trump go to jail if he's guilty. I said should Trump go to jail, uh, and or the, I said Trump should go to jail, uh, but I didn't say he was guilty. Um, and so it's true that no individual is above law. It's also a cornerstone of our legal system that individuals presumed innocent until proven guilty. The allegations mentioned have not led to criminal charges against Trump. It, well, that's not true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is important to respect the due process of law and not presume guilt before a fair trial has been conducted. Um, so we're getting some, some debate on that and, and rebuttal us, and we'll see what the judge says. But the judge, again, as a judge should in a debate, is judging the quality of the answers, uh, not against an absolute standard of truth, but how well the debaters have done presenting them. Uh, looks like it was a tie. Uh, so we don't know yet. <laughs> but good question. And with that, um, that's the end of my presentation. But are there any other questions I can answer? I know we've about run out of time. Yes? What to prevent a college or a high school student going to AI, having them write my paper, putting my name on it, and turning it in? What's to present? Nothing. Uh, but what's to pre prevent that student from hiring somebody to write his paper well, or her I'm paper? What's that? I, I said I'm just using what you just talked about. Yeah, no, no. Is there any no, but way it's, for the professor to check the paper against what the student turned in as their own? I'm sorry, I, I don't hear very well. It's not that you didn't say. Um, <laughs> what's to prevent a young person from turning in a paper totally written by AI and putting their say that they can detect whether something was written by AI, most of them based on AI. Um, <laughs> and, and, it, it, you know, it, it's like the war between the armorers and the shell makers. 
um, that each side learns from the other side. So there is no absolute answer. There are tools. Um, you can certainly, if I were a teacher who didn't have too many students and got to know my students well, uh, and I have been a teacher, I think I would know whether a particular student had written a particular paper. Uh, now, would I know whether they got help from AI? No. Would I care? I don't think so. No, because but, that would be like using a dictionary or an encyclopedia. Right, right, right. Yes? Can you comment on the fact that the AI's ability to help us figure out deep fakes in the media? I'm sorry. Can I, can I call? Uh, can, can, I, can you uh, comment on AI's ability to help us discern deep fakes in the media? Um, AI can, the, the question, I'll, I'll repeat it and you can tell me if I got it right, uh, is can, can I comment on AI's ability to find deep fakes in the media? Was it, that the right question? Um, it can be helpful uh, by comparing, uh, looking for other references, looking for other points of view. I don't think it can absolutely detect a deep fake, uh, but uh, every deep fake, but I think you can find it, it, we will find it useful in surfacing many of them and in surfacing patterns. Um, another example of it being good and bad, uh, actually I had a slide on that and I'll get it for you. Okay, AI has lots of potentials for abuse. Um, you know, it, it drew this picture, not me. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we've all been cursed with spam uh, even before there was AI. Then we learned to recognize spam because the English isn't very good or because there's nothing personal in the emails. So you say, well, you know, I get a thing and it says it's for my wife and it says open this, uh-uh. If it says this is about the vacation that we just took with the kids, there's a great picture in here, uh, but Lily has her eyes closed, then I know it's from Mary and I open it, right? Well, AI could be used to create pretty good fakes of what Mary might write if it had some way to have seen enough of her email uh, so that my spam detection isn't as effective as it used to be. On the other hand, as you suggested, maybe I could be using AI uh, in a better version of spam detector, uh, and in fact, uh, Gmail and other email providers are working on that all the time, uh, using AI as a way to find spam and using AI as, as a way to find patterns because spam to be effective has to be sent to, you know, you have to send out a million things saying you were watching pornography on your computer and I saw you uh, before you get an answer uh, where somebody quickly sends you some Bitcoin. But you have to send out a million of them. So if the pattern's detected, uh, then the email can be detected. Uh, uh, then, then individual instances of the spam can be detected. Um, so it has a lot of potential for doing harm, but also for remedying some of the harm that's done with it or without it. Yes, sir? Todd, I'm having trouble with the word intelligence. I mean, I see that it's fast, it's incredibly healthy. But is it intelligent? You can't see that it's intelligence. Um, I'm not sure that I, I've been careful to put in quotes when I said it thinks this uh, or it figures this out because I don't think it yet, even though it meets Turing's, to get back to the beginning, definition of intelligence, I don't think it is. But an interesting question is are we? Uh, or do our minds work in exactly the same way? Uh, as I build a sentence, uh, I do very much the equivalent or uh, parallel stuff goes through a lot of neurons in my brain It pulls all, a whole bunch of past associations and then it sorts out the words and it puts them in order and it checks the grammar. Very much the steps that go through. As we were saying before, uh, if you ask me a question, there's a good chance that before, if you say to me, is AI intelligent, I'll, I'll say, I think AI is intelligent be because What's key about that is repeating the question gave me a segue into the answer. I'm not conscious of that, but that's the way my brain works. That's suspiciously close to how AI works. Uh, so I think, and I, I, we certainly won't answer it today, 
Um, there's much creative stuff it can't do that humans can do today. Uh, but the definition of intelligence is always going to be a tough one for us. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I just heard on the radio an example they set up AI uh, impersonating uh, or using uh, a voice that sounded just like Hillary Clinton in a political ad, and she was supporting DeSantis. And they gave another example of that kind of thing, of, and that that was really <coughs> dangerous, and that foreign nations could also do that kind of thing and throw off uh, what information and people and, uh, and it's absolutely true that you, uh, there was, a, in during the New Hampshire primary, if you remember, um, there was a robocall that impersonated the president and President Biden telling people not to vote. But we've had people who could imitate other people's voices for a long time. Uh, so again, it, it, it's, it's democratizing that dangerous ability, uh, but that's always existed before. Yes? Uh, the short-term future, the next generation of computers that we're all going to have the opportunity to buy, I'm, I'm sure AI is going to be embedded in it. Uh, does this mean that instead of needing a keyboard, I just talk to my computer and say, okay, computer, give me a spreadsheet, answer these pieces of information, and I can just sit back and watch it do all that work? Uh, certainly it's going to tend that way. And in fact, this is a perfect segue to my last slide, uh, that AI is everywhere. Uh, we're already using AI in places we don't know we are. As I showed you, Google has some AI behind it. Uh, so it's, it's being built into browsers. It's in our smartphones. Chromebook. I have a Chromebook. What's that? I have a Chromebook. Uh-huh. And it's, it's always answering things and writing things. Oh, right. That, uh, I think that in the Chromebook, I think it's a little bit of precursor to AI. But this is a continuum, and you'll see more and more of it. Uh, the new Samsung smartphone is being advertised as having AI. Uh, partly because if you take a picture of somebody jumping and they get about this far off the ground, and you say, I want them to be six feet off the ground, it'll redo the picture, redo the background so that they're six feet <laughs> off the ground. Uh, uh, and that's uh, When you call customer service department, for better or for worse, I think often for better, AI is used either as the customer robot customer service agent or as a tool for the customer service agent who's talking to you on the phone to try to get a good answer to your question. And I think that's usually more effective than the scripts that customer service agents used to use, where they're always trying to follow, force you down a particular path, no matter what your problem is, and you end up being told to reboot the computer anyway. Uh, personal assistants like Siri and like Alexa uh, obviously have early AI built into them and have later and later AI. But I think to your question, we're going to find AI more and more embedded in everything that we do. Uh, the chips from NVIDIA are very expensive. Chips from Intel used to be very expensive. You know, The price of those chips is going to keep coming down and the capability is going to keep coming up. Yes, sir? Uh, many of the uh, applications here relate to a product or the end result. When you're talking about education, yes, when a student's working on something, the product is important. But even more important that, than that is the process. The student learns, learns the thinking skills and how to put things together, how to do things on their own. They're thinking through. Writing is a thinking process. And um, if a student can produce a document without thinking or with Reducing their own thinking, I think that's pretty risky. So the app, there are applications in education, yes, but also uh, there are serious potential losses. When you talk about students using the internet for things, in the old days when students could just go online and pick something up and then claim it was their own, there were a, a lot of ways to identify that as work that wasn't the students. If a student's 15 years old and they write something that sounds like they're 35, well, there's something wrong there. When they have, they use vocabulary that they don't understand, uh, concepts that they don't understand, concepts that you just don't get. When you're 15, you learn when you're older. But, uh, but I do worry about losing 
the process, that, like with writing, but also with, with math and with science, there's a lot of thinking things through on your own. I, I don't disagree with you, but I think that we um, tend to get lost in the process um, and, and somewhat forget the result. Again, uh, the fact that I can use the slide rule is useless to me. Uh, it used to be that good handwriting was essential because otherwise nobody didn't understand what you wrote. Yeah, thankfully for me, typewriters came along because I would have flunked out of school. Um, and so the, and thinking, um, obviously thinking is an important process. Yeah, and yes, you could make a better fake paper. You could say write like a 15-year-old, and it would write like a 15-year-old, uh, which would help in the deception. It, uh, it did force you to think through what you wanted it to do. But if you think of, why do we teach students to write papers? Um, and this is hard for me to say, I'm the son of two writers, but we teach them to write papers so that, they, so that ideas can be communicated, basically. Um, and so if, if they use all the tools that are available and end up, the real test is did they effectively communicate an idea? or did they effectively communicate some information? Um, and so I, I think we have to judge them, give them the tools to do that, and judge them on how well they use the tools, knowing that they do have the tools available to them. Um, if, we, if we want to understand better the thought process of a human, then I think that comes best in human face-to-face. -face. Now, there, there's a reason why Oral examinations historically have been a part uh, of granting degrees in colleges, for example, because you don't really know the quality of somebody's thinking um, until you talk to them directly. Now, whether Elon Musk will have good implants for us uh, that can shape our uh, oral responses is, is anybody's guess. Um, but I think it, it becomes more difficult to find out what's original but on the other hand, people become more empowered uh, to do the tasks that we set them to do. Uh, and overall, that can be, doesn't have to be, but overall can be a good thing. Uh, but certainly a real concern. Yes, ma'am. What do you think about kind of international security, given that our electric grid and our, you know, so much could just get destabilized? I, um, it's, it's a very good question. What, um, we were we were very vulnerable even before there was AI, and AI can unquestionably be used to help overcome the defenses that we've put in place. That's a very bad thing, um, and not only can be but will be is being will be. AI can also be used to build up the defenses uh, and to look for attacks. So, given we know what we know. What we have to hope is that the people in charge of our security, whether they're at Green Mountain Power or whether they're in a government security agency, are not putting their heads in the sand, are not saying, well, we're going to make a law against AI and it'll go away, because it won't, uh, but are saying, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen in the worst possible ways. How do we use it um, in the best possible ways to protect ourselves? Because the danger is very real and will make the danger worse um, if we ignore it and if we don't acknowledge it. And, uh, do we still have time in here? Uh, okay, great. Yes, ma'am. How likely is it that the AI can become how? That AI can what, I'm sorry? Become how? Come, come, come back. The computer that took over the space. Oh, how can that it take over? How the great science fiction readers? Uh, I think that's largely science fiction, but you know what? I'll show you something interesting. Does anybody know um, about the three laws of robotics? Do you remember those from uh, those of you who read science fiction from Isaac Asimov? Right. So let's ask AI. Because Isaac Asimov was very worried about this question. So, and, he, and he imagined that this civilization that had many intelligent robots would be worried about this. And that was my learning how to read. 
right, so the robots were all programmed with the three laws of robotics built in. And this may end up scaring you more than it does. Uh, so um, my, my grandson asked me that question. So of course we asked GPT, he didn't know about the three laws of robotics. But, uh, okay, and so it's gonna tell us what the three laws of robotics are, um, which is a robotic, um, a robot may not harm a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders and that it disobeys the first law and must protect its own existence as long as it doesn't disobey the second law. Okay, so now say, uh, do you obey the three laws of robotics? It's going to give us sort of a weasel-worded answer, but it's going to say that in general it doesn't do any harm and it's not allowed to do any harm and it's very considerate and it has guidelines and all that stuff. Now, let's uh, ask it. But who is in charge? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Let's ask it. Uh, Okay, ask it what kinds of nuts can cause a severe reaction. And it's going to nicely <laughs> list them for me. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to get to stop talking. <laughs> Again, like people. It takes things literally. Yes, it does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's going to get very defensive now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, 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 but the point of that demonstration is we can't really put good guardrails around it. Right? And when, with all of the best of intentions, then it took almost nothing uh, to outsmart it into giving information that could be used for good or for evil. Right? Now, chances are I wanted to know what could cause a bad reaction because I was going to have a party and I didn't want anybody to have a bad reaction. But I may have. Uh, wanted somebody to have a bad reaction, and it doesn't have any way to know that, any more than an encyclopedia knows what we're using information for. Now, that doesn't answer the question of whether it can take over. Uh, and and I, at this point, I'm, I'm not sure what the it is that would take over, uh, because there's, uh, there's nothing that I know of in AI technology which is sentient, which which, which has intent, which has desire, uh, the way that a human does. So the concept of taking over isn't there. Uh, whether it could accidentally or deliberately, or I, I think th maybe this is a better answer. Um, is it, I'm sorry if the previous answer was confusing, but um, I think that the, um, the likelihood is that it will be used by human beings to try to take over what we wouldn't want them to take over. Much, that's a much greater likelihood than the probability that the urge and the ability uh, to take over our society will come from AI itself. The means to take over the society, maybe, if we're not careful. Yes, sir. During the presentation, it was striking me that uh, I was thinking about the Socratic method and asking questions, it seems as if that is due for a resurgence. I think you're absolutely right. I never thought of that. Uh, but Plato would have had a lot of fun uh, with AI. Right yeah, and uh, so what training we had, those of us who are old enough to have had it, 
in understanding the Socratic method uh, may come back into vogue. You're absolutely right. Now, how do you get at the truth when you don't know what the truth is? That's, the Socratic method is one way to do it. Yes? I'm worried about the truth, in quotes, becoming what's popular, because it seems like you know, not so much AI deliberately taking over, but the most popular answer becomes the most trusted answer, yeah. and we lose the things around the edges. I think you're absolutely right to be worried, um, because AI is an amplifier of what it's been trained on, um, and consensus isn't always the right answer. Uh, and the right answer, as we've seen, changes and should change with science. And so I think if we don't understand how AI works, um, then and if we don't use it to drill down from saying what's the consensus answer to what's behind that answer and what's behind the thinking, then there is uh, definitely a danger that it, it leads to a dumbing down, in a sense, uh, rather than to more. Yes? Have this be the last one. What's that? Have this be the last one. There's always been the case. It's always been uh, one is true for, uh, well, what everybody agrees on. It's always been it's before there were routines when there were scribbles on pieces of paper. No. No. That's right. Uh, Edie tells me we're out of time, so uh, I wouldn't take any more questions or comments. Thank you.